Okay, full disclosure. This video was inspired by Belated Media's fantastic What If Episode 1 Was Good video. So if you haven't already seen it, it's got about 1.2 million views, so you're probably the only person. Uh, go check it out. After mine, before mine, whatever. Just watch both. So, I have this intriguing headline, how Star Wars Episode 2 could have saved everything. It's probably the reason why you're here. And now, without further ado, I'm going to get to it. I think it's fair to say at this time that the prequel trilogy falls short not only for fans of the series, but casual moviegoers as well. People who don't know the difference between an AT-AT and an AT-ST walker couldn't care less about the midichlorians. Master, what are midichlorians? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. And whose eyes glaze over when you mention Han I shoots first? Have. But it didn't need to be this way. Yes, I bet you have. There are a few, but significant changes in the structure and story of Episode 2 that would have transformed Star Wars into the most ambitious, epic saga ever to grace the cinema screens. Instead of one really great trilogy, followed by a not-so-great trilogy, and serious hope for the future with Episode 7. People have already mentioned ways of cutting the movie to make it better, removing the droid factory scene on Geonosis, removing much of the Colosseum battle, most of the dialogue, but there's a larger, more fundamental problem with the movie, a giant missed opportunity, and no amount of trimming can fix it. First of all, as has been repeated countless times for over a decade, we don't care about the characters. We start off with Obi-Wan and Anakin already antagonistic towards each other, from the first lines, they're bickering. Sorry, Master. That was some shortcut, Anakin. He went completely the other way. Once again, you've proved if you'll excuse me. Not exactly indications of a super strong friendship. It's more like rejected lines between C-3PO and R2-D2 from the original trilogy. Well, I wasn't naked for long. The antagonism shouldn't have been introduced in their first scene. This scene should have been about Anakin being smitten by Padme. He shouldn't start off fantasizing about her. He should have been introduced as the noble Padawan on his way to becoming a valiant Jedi Knight. He shouldn't know her to begin with. Padme should have been the kink in his armor, his fatal flaw, what the Greeks refer to as hamartia. That should have been the topic of Obi-Wan and Anakin's first dialogue, so that when we are finally introduced to Padme, she's given something to do in the script that makes the audience understand why Anakin would be attracted to her. Instead, George relies on the dramatically inert tell-and-not-show method of screenwriting. We're constantly told that Anakin loves her, but he never shows any actions to indicate it. Nor does she ever perform any action for us to believe a Jedi would throw away his promising career just for her. The opening chase scene is too long for no reason. Compare this scene to another famous chase scene, The French Connection. It lasts about seven minutes, and it's basically a stuntman driving from one end of the street to the other, but it's one of the most famous chases in cinema history. It's not just because it was one of the first, it's also, and mainly, because of what the chase tells us about this unique character. He's risking life and limb, crashing through the dense, populated city streets, putting his own and everybody else's life at jeopardy. Notice how the shots align so closely. Visually, it's the same information, but narratively, it's another matter. What do we learn about Anakin from this scene? He's a show-off, but then so is Obi-Wan. I mean, he just launched himself through a plate glass window. What else do we get? That Anakin is worried for Obi-Wan? Sure, but they carry out the scene as routine as a traffic stop.
Look at Popeye's face. He's furious. Is he aware he's gone too far this time? Does he care? As an audience, we get to ask these questions that the director has posed for us, and the answers are always interesting. Whoa! Popeye gets his man no matter what the collateral. George should have asked himself, what did he want us to get out of this scene? If you want to show Anakin as a rebellious renegade who goes against Obi-Wan's orders, don't have him act like a whiny brat in the scene before. Have him go full-on Dark Knight in this scene. Have him busting through barriers and blowing ships out of the way, causing collateral damage and misusing the Force to get his mark. Which would have also been a great way to introduce the Force visually and kinetically in this film. The aftermath of this scene gives Anakin and Obi-Wan something to fight about in the next scene. Something that the audience knows about, not some vague encounter with a nest of Gundarks. The chase could be any length you wanted at the point, and it still would have had meaning. And we would learn so much about these characters, and more importantly, about the dynamics of their relationships with one another. From this one action scene. And then, if George had set up Anakin as a noble Padawan before, he could then have Anakin try and figure out why he'd lost control in that scene, thereby hinting at feelings building towards Padme. You call this a diplomatic solution? No, I call it aggressive negotiations. And also suggesting a darker Anakin lurking within our supposedly white knight. Because Anakin spends far too much time expressing his feelings. Not only does it go back to that show, don't tell story mechanic, it doesn't make sense within the logic of the Jedi universe. If there's supposed to be these emotionless monks, wouldn't Obi-Wan be immediately tipped off to the fact that Anakin is always not only expressing himself, but has wildly uncontrollable and erratic feelings? He's holding me back! I... I killed them. You can't have these people say and do things in a vacuum just because you've got a basic plot point, Anakin must love Padme, because we're never given a reason to even understand why Padme should care about Anakin. Please don't look at me like that. Why not? It makes me feel uncomfortable. Sorry, milady. His grin afterwards just makes him creepy. He's also rude and impulsive with her. Oh, Anakin's not a Jedi yet. He's still a Padawan learner. But I was thinking... Hold on a minute. Excuse me. I was thinking I would stay in the lake country. There's some places up there that are very isolated. Excuse me. I'm in charge of security here, milady. And this is my home. I know it very well. That is why we're here. Well, excuse me, princess. So instead of the fallen Jedi warrior of prophecy, George Lucas reveals Anakin Skywalker to be nothing more than a whiny voyeur. If that's his intent, fine, go for it George, but make Obi-Wan the hero and use this trilogy to peel back the myths surrounding Anakin's supposed goodness. The tactic worked brilliantly in Amadeus, and if they'd put it in this movie, it could have suggested a possible rivalry or jealousy for one another, giving them something to do other than stand around and occasionally walk. then the point Milos Forman was making doesn't match with what Lucas established in the original trilogy. 
Anakin was set up as a good soul corrupted absolutely by power. He needed to be a paragon of virtue in this movie, a sort of Lucifer before the fall, making his tragic fall to the dark side all the more tragic. Grazie, signore. Nolan managed this to brilliant effect with his cinematic rendition of Harvey Dent in The Dark Knight. He doesn't waste time suggesting Dent has evil within him. Instead, he depicts Dent as the moral center of the Dark Knight universe. Batman is the moral gray area, and it's this understanding by Bruce that leads him to hope Batman can be replaced by a better symbol. So when the Joker destroys that symbol of hope so effectively, Nolan demonstrates not only the supreme depths of the Joker's villainy, he makes a frightening statement on the nature of the human soul, namely how fragile it can be, which is what Lucas could have done, and five years earlier, what he seemed to be hinting at with the original trilogy, but instead, he bogs his prequel trilogy down in prophecy and spiritual mumbo-jumbo. I need an analysis of this blood sample I'm sending you. Wait a minute. The reading is off the chart. Over 20,000. Even Master Yoda doesn't have a midi chlorian cut that high. So, too often, Not you've got characters whining to each other about their feelings. You've got Obi-Wan complaining about Anakin to Yoda and Mace Windu. I'm concerned for my Padawan. He is not ready to be given this assignment on his own yet. His abilities have made him, well, arrogant. Yes, yes. Rather than showing us moments which would have let us know, he was concerned. Like the chase we never really got. Instead, we get stuff like this. Anakin. Don't do anything without first consulting either myself or the council. Yes, master. Or take the very next scene where Anakin complains to Padme and Obi-Wan, calling him overly critical. Master Obi-Wan manages not to see it. Don't get me wrong. Obi-Wan is a great mentor. As wise as Master Yoda and as powerful as Master Windu. I am truly thankful to be his apprentice. In some ways... A lot of ways. I'm really ahead of him. I'm ready for the trials. But he feels that I'm too unpredictable. He won't let me move on. It's worse. He's overly critical. He never listens. He doesn't understand. It's not fair. When has Obi-Wan been overly critical this entire movie? Don't forget, we haven't seen these people in like a decade. We don't know their dynamic. The only thing we know is what Lucas shows us. And so far, he's shown us these moments of Obi-Wan being critical. Anakin! She went into the club, Master. Patience. Use the Force. Think. Sorry, Master. He went in there to hide, not to run. Yes, Master. Next time, try not to lose it. Yes, Master. This weapon is your life. I try, Master. Why do I get the feeling you're going to be the death of me? If this is what Anakin considers overly critical, I'm beginning to worry that he's just a crazy, overly sensitive child with PMS. He's holding me back! Which is not exactly a compelling character for a trilogy, much less as the basis for an entire saga. On that same note of show, don't tell, have Anakin be forced to deal with consequences for his actions. His lust for power would have been better served as an extension of that idea that he is the chosen one. That way, you wouldn't need to keep reminding us that he's the chosen one. He is the chosen one. You are the chosen one! We could tell when Anakin desires more power. But the women. That's another thing. Anakin just children. keeps saying he wants more power, but he never actually tries to like get animals. it in any way. If that's like the animals. goal of this character, it should factor into I the plot them. in a major way. Consider the original trilogy. Luke wanted to become a famed pilot. He got much more than he bargained for and accomplished his goal. Han Solo wanted riches. He got much more than he bargained for and accomplished his goal. Leia wanted freedom. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Do you see a pattern forming here? In this movie, we have no idea who wants what. Okay, Anakin wants Padme. Why, we're never sure. Padme wants Anakin to leave her alone. Oh, just kidding, never mind. And Obi-Wan wants to find a man? 
Why? Curious. It's just all so muddled, and Hope they have to keep constantly telling us what they want because they don't actually know. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. So, getting back to what Anakin wants. Have him want to become the best Jedi. So that way, when he decides to go save his mother, it's only because he can't get her to shut up in his head. So his reason for doing this seemingly crazy and altruistic gesture towards his mother, we learn are simply for selfish, power-hungry reasons. That's dark. That's evil. That's Darth Vader. Not this. Then, all of that relates to that prophecy, because he can explain at this point, just for the sake of cluing us in, that he wants more power because he thinks he's owed it, or needs it. Whatever reason you want, George, you kind of hint at it with wanting more power to keep people from dying. I will even learn to stop people from dying. But at this point, it doesn't really make sense, because he seems to hate Obi-Wan, just wants to bang Padme, and the only other person of consequence in his life just got gang-raped by a bunch of scruffy-looking nerf herders. Who's he trying to save? Jar Jar? There could have been an intriguing irony to watching someone trying to fulfill their potential causing their own downfall. The idea would have been brought to its completion by Anakin's actions in Episode 3, where by trying to save Padme from death, he ironically causes it, and his own destruction. We could have had a compelling thematic narrative streaming along the trilogy. It would have rewarded successive viewings to watch how one man fell from grace, rather than to be constantly told that's exactly what happened and what is going to happen. This way would have been an organic, demonstrative process, rather than George constantly telling us the plot. Anakin's power trip could also have been fueled by his relationship with Obi-Wan. The biggest problem with the character dynamic in this film is that it's never clear. Are Obi and Anakin supposed to be tutor-disciple type relationship, or a bromance? Gunfighter, where are you going, master? For a drink. For example, the very next scene after he meets Padme for the first time in years, he's already talking to Obi-Wan like they're college roommates. Albeit with degrees in poetic expression. Just being around her again is intoxicating. Be mindful of your thoughts, Anakin. They betray you. You have made a commitment to the Jedi Order, a commitment not easily broken. If they'd made it more of a father-son type relationship, albeit unspoken, there's already way too much talking about relationships in this movie. Believe me, I wish that I could just wish away my feelings. Then it would have been compelling to watch Anakin try to live up to the seemingly impossible ideal set up by the prophecy. Likewise, Obi-Wan could have been overwhelmed by the knowledge that he was training the Messiah of the Force, and this pressure got to him. So Obi-Wan's fear about Anakin that he expresses in confidence with Yoda and Windu could have been phrased along the lines of Obi-Wan fearful that he was failing in some way. But he takes absolutely no responsibility for it. He just blames Anakin for all of his problems. The gesture makes Obi-Wan seem weak and incapable of handling even a Padawan. Why would the Council continue to allow him to train Anakin if he's admitting that he's doing such a terrible job? Why not have Obi-Wan's goal in this movie be to live up to the promise he made to Qui-Gon in the first movie, that he would train Anakin to the best of his abilities? Then there would have been some interesting story arcs, as Obi-Wan has to juggle his mission with his duty to Anakin's education. Anakin seems to be at the same age as Obi-Wan in the first movie, and at that age, Obi-Wan is being recommended for the Jedi Trials. Why couldn't the same mechanic have been carried over to Anakin's situation? I take Anakin as my Padawan learner. An apprentice? You have, Qui-Gon. Impossible to take on a second. The code forbids it. Obi-Wan is ready. I am ready to face the trials. Our own counsel we will keep on who is ready. The movie could have started with Anakin failing the trials, and immediately the whole prophecy is in danger. The Chosen One can't pass the trials? Is Obi-Wan fit to teach him? And so Anakin's frustrations with Obi-Wan's teaching methods would have been entirely justified and vindicated by an opening scene that could have delved even further into the realm of the Force and the Jedi Order. And Obi-Wan and Anakin would have had some real reasons to be antagonistic towards each other. The absence of strong father figures would have also been amplified by Anakin's immersion in a culture filled with fatherless figures. Like Obi-Wan, whose only father figure, Qui-Gon, was murdered before him. 
In a moment which would have paralleled or perhaps even foreshadowed Anakin's actions with the Sand People, we as an audience could have been reminded and Anakin could have learned for the first time that Obi-Wan killed Darth Maul out of revenge. This history and dynamic would have been a powerful contrast to the importance Anakin's mother plays in his journey. Take for example the romance scenes. There's no impetus behind any of them. They're fleeing for their lives, but they still have time to stop for a bloody picnic? No, take a page from the Bourne franchise and have these characters constantly in jeopardy. Have their romance and dialogue build naturally from that tension. Have them running for their lives from a cunning villain who's always two steps ahead. That's another problem with this film. Who's the villain supposed to be? As someone who's watched the original trilogy, I'm aware it's the Emperor. But for people who watch the series in the order Lucas intends, 1 through 6, which you should never do by the way, there's almost an hour and a half before we even get a glimpse of our first puppet master, Count Dooku. But if George had bothered to enforce the tenacity of the villains by giving us a sort of Moriarty character who will stop at nothing to kill Padme, then by the time Dooku is finally revealed in the third act, we understand the sadistic and unstoppable nature of this villain. Because as it stands, we get two attempts, and then it's like the film forgets that the original plot was trying to kill Padme. Did the villains just stop caring about their masterful, dastardly uh. plans? <laughs> MacGuffins are fine. Even using people as MacGuffins is fine, so long as it's used at the expense of conveying as much information as possible. The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. Huh? Lucas gives us plot, and a fair amount of plot, and always at the expense of characterization for both hero and villain alike. If Dooku had been hunting the pair the entire movie, then his entrance would have made for an important reveal. As an audience of the original trilogy, we would have been expecting the Emperor from the beginning, and Lucas could have teased us with this possibility, a sort of wink to the fans, but still delivering a film for first-time viewers, which, when Dooku was finally revealed, would have been a surprise to everybody. And then... Even though we have never met this man before, we immediately know he's a force to be reckoned with. He's got Django Fett on a leash. The entire Trade Federation cowers at his command. He's built his own clone army. He spent the whole movie trying to kill Padme. He means business. So now, when he captures Obi-Wan, there's genuine tension in this scene. We're afraid for him. We know what Dooku is capable of, but we have no idea what he's planning. The scene could have taken on a suggestion that Dooku might have wanted to seduce him to the dark side, which would have been an interesting parallel to the Emperor scene in the sixth movie, as well as Vader with his son in the fifth movie. Luke, you can destroy the Emperor. He has foreseen this. It is your destiny. Join me. And together, we can rule the galaxy as father and son. And just reinforcing again how the Sith are always on the prowl for power. And so Dooku's acknowledgement that Obi-Wan was worthy enough to take the place of disciple would have not only hearkened back to Anakin's failed trials at the beginning, and him wondering if he should get a new master, but we could have also seen a glimpse of Obi-Wan being tested, his own trials, with the opportunity for unlimited power in this scene, only this time as a disciple of Dooku, who we learn was the master of Qui-Gon, and so the whole father figure trope could have returned with a vengeance, and we would have had a better understanding of the seductive power of the dark side. We would immediately understand without Yoda having to preach that people choose the dark side because it fulfills a need. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. And then we would understand that's why the Jedi are so against their disciples having any needs. It's not just because they're squares. It's because it gives an opening for the dark side to take over. So now, 
In light of this, the scene cuts before we ever learn Obi-Wan's decision, and we're concerned that maybe he's broken and turned to the dark side. Maybe the pressure of training the Chosen One proved too much, and he's been convinced that the only way to make Anakin the ultimate Jedi, and to complete his promise to Qui-Gon, is by rounding out his education with the dark side, something which the Emperor alludes to in the third movie. But of course, we know he's not going to turn to the dark side. Not just because we've seen episodes see, four through Jedi six, but because we know who Obi-Wan is. The whole movie has been establishing that. So, when he shows his resolve not to turn, that also strengthens our understanding of his character. We understand now and forever that he's the ultimate source of good. And, moreover, he realizes this, and with his triumph, he knows that, yes, he is the perfect leader for Anakin. So, with that, he's accomplished his goal for the movie. Then, at the end of the movie, when the person we initially assumed to be the most powerful badass in the universe, Dooku, is actually only the apprentice of the mysterious Sith figure from the first movie, we're left begging for the third movie to come out so we can see just how evil this man is and how crazy things are going to get for our characters. If they barely survive this movie, what's going to happen next? Don't forget, if we had never seen the original trilogy, we have no idea what his power is, or indeed even who or what he is. Also at the end of this movie, we could have learned from Dooku and the Emperor's dialogue that the Emperor was actually the one trying to kill Padme all along, because he knew it would get Anakin and her together, and he wanted nothing more than Anakin back on Coruscant so he could keep tabs on him. This would have also explained why the Emperor killed the decoy by mistake. Of course he knew she used a decoy. He was present for the first movie. Newt Gunray knew it too. Your occupation here has ended. <laughs> After her! This one's a decoy! No, the Emperor never fails. He did it on purpose. And then he continues to try and kill Padme because he knows how much she means to Anakin. He simultaneously brings the pair together just so he can rip them apart and break Anakin's heart. He takes Anakin to the breaking point of his ideals in order to protect Padme. And by the end of the film, Anakin is driven to take his vengeance against Dooku. Part of it is revenge, the other part is to protect Padme, and thereby converts him to the dark side. It would simultaneously explain why a novice like Anakin would have been given this assignment, which itself would have demonstrated the extent of Palpatine's power over the Jedi, and would have helped to explain why a clone army was created more than ten years ago. They say Master Sabatius placed an order for a clone army at the request of the Senate almost ten years ago! Lucas should have pushed that number back even further, make it uncannily reminiscent of Anakin's age. Then, when the Emperor has his unusual monologue in the third movie where he talks about manipulating Medichlorians to create life, suddenly the entirety of Episode 2 and that brief mention of Anakin having no father in Episode 1 makes total sense. There's a better reason now why it's called Attack of the Clones. In a startling instant that would have rivaled Vader's reveal in Episode 5, we would most likely gasp when we realized that the Emperor had cloned and raised his perfect disciple in a master strategy covering Anakin's entire lifespan. It would have been an eerie echo to the clone army he had also assembled. And what better leader of a clone army than a clone of the Emperor himself? And suddenly, all that pseudo-scientific babble about Metachlorians from Episode 1 has an unbelievable purpose to the entire saga. This revelation, by the way, could have been the deciding moment in the third film, the beginning of the end for Anakin. The question that he would have had to come to grapple with for the rest of the film would become whether it is in his nature to be evil. Is he determined by his maker, the Emperor, to be damned? Or does he still have a choice? His redemption in Episode 6 would have extended beyond merely one man's redemption, but that of human nature made all the more powerful by Luke's subsequent rejection of the same fate that befell his father, the Emperor's clone. It would have been a positive statement on our power to choose who we will become, more than our past or even some all-powerful force controlling our destinies. It's free will that represents the ultimate power in the universe, more than any Jedi or Sith or technological terror. It would all be insignificant next to the power of the force of our will.
It's like Lucas went for the most obvious parallels without ever addressing or even noticing the ones that mattered. And for that and all the reasons I've listed, episode two is a missed opportunity.